Okay, buddy. So I make that one o'clock. So uh, we'll get started. So first of all, I just wanted to say to welcome everybody. Thank you for coming along to the first of the RSE series webinars. Um, we hope that this is going to be a pretty successful series, and we're going to have lots of interesting uh, presentations and topics um, as time goes on. I would encourage anybody who's here or always listens to the video to, if you have an idea for a topic, please get in touch. And um, we're always willing for to uh, make an opportunity for people to speak about things they're interested in in the field of research software engineering and that's um, a very broad interpretation of what topics are available so please just get in touch have a look at the uh, RSC website at the webinar series section for more information on um, how to get in touch and the sorts of presentation we're looking for so I think the first thing I just want to uh, say introduce um, Hussein who's an assistant professor of computer science at um, Ball State University in the US, who's going to talk to us about um, object-oriented design for scientists. Um, I particularly want to say thank you to Hussein for being the first one um, to go through this process and have to deal with all the teething issues as we get things sorted out. Um, but um, I'm sure his presentation will be very interesting. So I'll hand over to him now. Um, Final, one final note that if you're asking questions during the presentation, uh, please use the chat window rather than speaking out loud and we'll try and we'll make sure Hussein's alerted to the fact that you've asked a question. Um, and thank you very much for coming again. Hussein, um, you're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. And uh, I really thank you and the RSE community for uh, uh, accepting me and uh, for the opportunity. So uh, uh, we talk, we talked yesterday. Uh, I can take questions in the middle as long as they are not very long, and the longer questions we can take it to the you know, end of the presentation. Uh, so this idea actually came into my mind that uh, uh, scientists need an object-oriented design. Uh, when I collaborated with professors from the operations research department, and see that their complaint is okay. We do one project. And then to do another project, we just more or less uh, copy everything and try to rename or uh, just uh, uh, change some small parts of the same code. So, of course, they weren't aware of the software engineering techniques that we use uh, uh, daily in our present uh, in our projects. Therefore, uh, it, I introduced them, and we, it really helped a lot. And therefore. We decided to continue collaborating and see how it will go for other uh, colleagues also. And I hope this also be helpful for you. Uh, I mean, of course, if you have uh, if you have taken software engineering courses, some things will be very familiar. So uh, we have lots of programming languages nowadays, as most of you are aware, and mostly general-purpose languages, meaning that anything can be implemented with them. And there are, of course, some specialized languages uh, like R or MATLAB or uh, other Q or et cetera, these kind of languages. But the, the thing is not about which language we choose for our programming purposes. It's about the complexity of the programs we create. For example, let's take this program. So a program is very simple when it is short and small, right? So it's just having two numbers adding the mob and printing the result. So it's non-complex. So of course, the things are getting tricky. How about when we go to more longer versions of this application? So for example, Chrome browser is 17 million lines of code. And Office is third, Office 2013 is 45 million, and Facebook is 60 million slash. Of course, they are not all in the same language. And probably they are not also storing at the same place. But anyway, we cannot expect people to put all 17 million slides sequentially on top of each other and expect someone to understand it. First of all, that's impossible. And second of all, of course, it's, it's torture. There are some solutions. Of course, uh, we need to maybe modularize. So let's take this piece of code that's composed of some black lines. Okay? So when the things get bigger, of course, we want to say, let's maybe create a couple methods out of this, functions out of this. And for these portions, let's create functions and 
Now our functions will look like that. And for the main program, maybe we will get a shorter version when we integrated the function calls. And of course, we can do more modularization like, okay, we see that these two parts are similar, except this part and this part. Maybe we need to modularize this method uh, with a parameter and say that, okay, now we will use the same method again. And this time our programs will get shorter and shorter. And hopefully it is more readable according to how we selected to create the functions. And now our main program is smaller. But of course, uh, you may be thinking now enough of the lines, give us something concrete. So I will start with Python. So we have, a, uh, we have three lines of code here. So it's printing just an information about the dog. So I'm a dog, I have four legs and my sound is something, right? So now I want to do this three times. Of course, the solution is this, right? Uh, not exactly, of course. What should we do? We should be smarter than that and we should maybe create a method out of this and call the method three times. Okay, call the function three times. But of course, you may be thinking, I mean, if you call it three times, I should maybe go for one step further and do this in a loop, like starting by one and ending up three. We can do this. Now, uh, let's add more parameters to this doc. So I want to also print the name of the doc. So this, this is the name of the doc. And of course, not all dogs are Rex. So therefore, in order to make some distinction between these, what we need to do, we need to make it by a parameter, right? So this is very common knowledge. And now we have a dog structure for different kind of, different names, different named dogs, Rex, Mingo, and Rack. But the things are getting tricky, of course. Now I want to print some other animal information. And here's the chicken. So, but I didn't like something in this code. So, okay, we have functions for a dog and functions for a chicken, but we have duplicates right here. I am, a, I have, my sound is, my name is. So there are duplications for the dog and for the, uh, for the dog and for the chicken. So what I want to do is of course, maybe we can do all of these are parameters. So the leg count, sound and name, then we can call the function as animal information and now we have chicken etc two legs sound is this and the name is this so that we can reuse the same method for different kind of animals now it's all good now but when we still look at this structure and this structure we see that there are still duplications so i need to reuse chicken i need to use two every time i want to print any information about a chicken. And I want to use, uh, I should use clock clock every time. Okay. So why should I do this? And the solution comes. So we are thinking maybe it would be nice if there is a special structure that knows what kind of an animal it is, knows how many legs it has, can make a sound by itself and has a name. Okay. So Actually, it would be nice to have this kind of structure. And when we really think about it, we are actually talking about the dog, right? So a real dog, real life dog is, you know, it, it knows how many legs it has. It can make sound itself. It has a name and uh, it knows its type, of course, and it's a dog. So in object-oriented design, this is, our, this is our main purpose. We are copying the real life structure in our application. And this copy is actually for a very good reason. There are not any questions. Okay. So this copy is for a very good reason. So let's check this quote from Harold Abelson, which maybe you are aware of the famous book, Structure Interpretation of Computer Programs. It's a very famous book for programming languages courses. So he says, first we want to establish the idea that the computer language is not just a way of getting a computer to perform operations but rather it is a novel formal medium for expressing ideas about the methodology. So basically, uh, a computer doesn't need fancy languages. A computer will be 
doing whatever we give as an instruction to them. We may be giving an instruction in assembly language. We may be giving instructions in machine language. We may be giving instructions in whatever language we don't want to uh, code in. But the programs must be written for people to read and only incidental informations to execute. So basically, languages are for us. Okay. So why on earth should we make our life harder by providing a non-readable, non-maintainable language? Right. That's why uh, we have to make the language as suitable as possible and as uh, uh, appropriate as possible for modeling what we have in mind. Okay. Because at the end of the day, the program will anyway get it and execute it. So let's come back to this epiphany. So we said it would be nice to have a spatial structure, and we have it, and we will do it in object-oriented design. It's also called sometimes object-oriented programming, object-oriented methodology, paradigm, design and analysis. So there are uh, synonyms there. So object-oriented design actually is the, is, uh, the uh, the core idea is very simple. So we are uh, copying the real life, and basically we have objects that know their types and attributes. So we have a square object that knows that a square is composed of sides, and the area can, can be calculated uh, like this, side times side. Or we can look at a triangle. A triangle object knows that it has a height and base, and the area can be calculated like this. So this is how object-oriented uh, objects look like. So they know how they are composed of and they know what to do with themselves. Whenever I need a square or a triangle, actually what I will do, I will just copy this and reuse it for uh, my other purposes. So let's identify some objects. So we said that we want to copy real life. So car, glass, bike, bus. So in real life are the objects Yes, they are. So these can be objects also. Dog, cat, person, laptop, they can be an object again. Running, walking, making a sound, do they look like object? Probably no. They are more like a, a actions that can be done by an object. A rectangle can compute its own area. People can run, etc., etc. Sight, height, number of legs. Oh, these are not also the objects. These are maybe properties that can be owned by an object, uh, like side of a rectangle or number of legs of a person. But when we look at a broader perspective, everything can be an object. It just depends on the context. If we are solving a problem about distance between two cities, it can also be an object. Then if we solve some relationship between family members, and it can also be an object. So nowadays, of course, most modern languages support object orientation. Of course, supporting object orientation means do they provide classes and do they provide visibility? Do they provide, you know, some, there are some uh, language structures that needs to be supported minimally in, an, in a programming language so that we can say it's supporting object orientation. But now there are various languages supports this there should be a way to represent this system regardless of the language we use, right? So that brings us to UML. So it's a unified modeling language, and it is basically a set of diagrams in order to be at the same page while designing object-oriented system or class-based system, agnostic then programming languages. So we said this is an object, and this is a rectangle object, this is a square object. So how it looks like in UML, of course, UML is very deep and they have lots of details, but I will just show the very basics. So this is how a class looks like in UML. So it's a square and it can compute its own area. Square type is integer, the name of the class. And the same for the rectangle. It is a height integer, base integer, and it can compute this area and return doubles. So the methods, attributes, and the name. So it's very straightforward. And actually, a class looks syntactically different in different languages according to how they design the language. But essence is the same. For example, this class is looking like this in C sharp. So public class square inside and public double computer area. Of course, it will look a bit different in Python, 
maybe it will look a bit different in C sharp, uh, C++, but more or less the essence is the same. So, wait, we were talking about objects, but now I said classes and I want to represent classes in languages. So what's happening here? So let's make the connection. So this is an object, right? This is a dog, is an object in real life. So this is another object. It's a dog object in real life. This is another object and this is a class. So you got the idea. The objects are instances. The class is a generalization of these all together. So a dog has a name, type, number of legs, and it can make a sound. And there is a special uh, uh, thing in uh, object-oriented design. So it's called constructor. So the constructor is co called create objects from classes. So it is a special method uh, getting the same name as the class. And what it does, it gets the specific information from outside and it creates an instance. So it creates a dog object or it creates a super object in this case. So that in our main application, we can say create a new square with a side of five. Create another square with a side of 10. So it's, uh, in most languages, it's more like there's a new keyword. And in Python, there is not a new keyword. You can just call the name of the class. But uh, the idea is the same. You're instantiating a class to be an object. Okay. Now square one is a square of five. Now, you remember our code, right? We had an animal information method. And we were printing these information. And we said that there are duplications. Now, of course, how it will affect our code after we adopt the object-oriented design, we will look at that. Now, in our scenario, we have animals. We have chicken, dog. So when we look at the real world, they are objects. So they should also be objects. Therefore, they should have classes in our scenario. right? So we have a class animal, because they are both animals anyway. And they have leg count, type, sound, and name. And they can print their information by themselves. And dog is an animal. Chicken also is an animal. But just the name differs among them. So when I create a dog, I know that it has four legs. And it, it can make the sound. And the type is this. Okay. So I do the same for chicken. Now it looks like this. Of course, I want to create objects out of this class structure, right? Because Rex. Is an object, so I don't see any rex over here because rex is an object. So let's create the rex. Rex equals dog. So this is in Python syntax, so there is no new keyword, but we are creating an object out of dog class. Then I say rex.info because rex is an animal, therefore it has an info method. It will print whatever it's supposed to print, just like this. And same for the chicken. But of course, uh, no fancy approach is without its consequences. Object-oriented design has lots of principles and concepts. And if we don't use these concepts and obey these principles, we aren't coding in proper object-oriented way. And what we do actually is we are basically coding in the old way, but with extra complexities and extra stuff we have to learn. So it's like your car, your car can go with 100 kilometers per hour, but you insist to go with a 30 on a highway because you don't want to miss, mess with the car and scare, scared about what happens if it, something goes wrong. It's like this. If you don't take the advantage of these concepts and principles, actually, you're using the object orientation wrong. Okay. So uh, 20 minutes already passed, I guess. So I will continue, and maybe I can skip some of them for the sake of time, but uh, I will be as brief as possible. So encapsulation. Encapsulation means protecting our information from being used incorrectly. So as we said, the objects have properties like the name, number of legs, or whatever property it has, right? So we need to protect this information. Let's take the scenario. So we have an airplane class, and the airplane has a speed attribute so that its speed can be set and we increase the speed or we decrease the speed. So airplane is an object, and so it has a speed, and it's going using that speed. But in this scenario, the problem is 
now anybody can set the speed of an airplane right so and what would happen if the speed is out of range or the speed is invalid or the speed is too high for an airplane to fly so what should happen in this case is object oriented design actually gives us the visibility modifiers like right here it says public integer speed public means it can be set by anyone externally but what if you want to do some adjustment before setting the speed like maybe for rainy weather or maybe for safety purposes we want to adjust so we will hide the speed attribute so that outside people cannot access directly behind some private method okay private attribute the private the speed is now private and i set the speed using a method this time and as you see i set the speed and then i do some adjustment for rainy weather and i can do any kind of adjustment right here okay so uh we did this now let's look at a more relevant example in terms of uh scientists we have an exporter and the exporter says we want to export some information or some data from our system and it takes a file directory okay? and we don't want this file directory to be set uh, by anybody in the system okay so because we want to do some checks first of all for example if some directory is set we want to be sure that it is if it exists or not then if it doesn't exist we will maybe throw an exception or return an error or do something else okay same and then if I, yes um, so yeah. asking what's the best way to choose between private and public variables what's the best way to choose between private and public variables so the best way uh, some of the things will be uh, private as long as we are thinking that it shouldn't be set outside directly so like the speed attribute speed is like very uh, i will say private uh, uh, you can think this like in terms of uh, the real privacy so it is very belong to the airplane and if it is set externally by outside classes then it will probably be a problem for the airplane okay so uh, we can think that private will go in this in this group and public will go that are public information like okay uh, just maybe read only information that nobody is needing to set it okay uh, but we can discuss this uh, after the presentation also so inheritance so this is another concept basically a class can inherit properties and operations from another class so you remember our animal class so uh, it has some methods and some attributes and the dog and cat was inheriting from that so in uml it looks exactly like this so an animal has a name and dog is an animal and cat is also an animal and they will both have access to name so that means dog also has a name and cat also has a name yeah. and how do we do it in uh, science for example we have a data reader okay so we have two kinds of different data formats and while reading this data to our system there are some common methods maybe opening the file and maybe reading the header and they there are some common methods that should happen regardless of the data format but there is also a specific structure for submit at all data and ounce at all data so that they need to be uh, treated differently and you see these common methods will be inherited by both data readers and these specific methods will be just belonging to the uh, specific readers Hans data and Smith data so we can use inheritance like this in a uh, real problem and another concept is polymorphism it's basically like having different forms of same operation so the uh, dictionary definition is this having different forms of same operation so you remember our animal example so we have a dog and we have a cat so now an animal can make sound but 
dog and cat will make different sounds, right? I mean, in this scenario, we know animals can make sounds, but we don't know how dogs or cats make a sound. So in the dog class itself, maybe we will define make sound again, which means we have to rewrite again, saying that, okay, it will tell woof woof, and in the cat, it will tell meow meow. So polymorphism means this. Now, make sound they are the same, signatures are the same, but it does a different method. Uh, it does a different uh, statement for dog and cat, so polymorphistic. And we can apply this in our pro problems, like we have a data fetcher and it will fetch data. So regardless of where it is fetching from, it will fetch data at one point. So, and we have maybe spatialized uh, data fetchers, fetch from Wikipedia or fetch from Google results. So they have the same method, fetch data, but this guy maybe will connect to Wikipedia and do something special for Wikipedia data. And this guy will connect to Google and it will do something else. With so the same method, different meanings. So polymorphism. And cohesion basically says a class should do one thing really well and should not try to do or be something else. And this doesn't necessarily mean the class should have only one method. But if we are creating a class, there should be only related method methods inside that. Let's look at this. We have a class and its methods are printing a document, sending an email, and calculating the distance between two points. So how do we name this class? Will we name it like a magic class? So it basically violates the cohesion uh, concept. It says there are three kinds of separate functionalities here. Maybe print document method should be somewhere in like document uh, utilities, okay? Or maybe it should be somewhere in printer class. Okay? Then send email should be in somewhere related and calculate distance maybe should be somewhere in log class, okay? logarithmic class. And so strong cohesion is a good feature. Strong cohesion means the relation between all of these methods are more or less related with the class itself. So when we check these relations between three methods, they are not really related to each other. So it's not a, it doesn't have a strong cohesion. And the same for our uh, problems. So a class may be reading a data from file. It may be connecting to Wikipedia and writing report to the file and calculating a square root. Okay. Can a class do this? Yes, it can, but how I will name this class so that I will reuse later on for other purposes. Okay. That's the importance of cohesion. So all of the related methods should be uh, extracted into different kind of classes. And coupling, this is more or less the extent to which classes depend on one another. Basically says, if you are creating a class, do not depend on too highly to other classes. Okay. This is like an overview of that. If we have like five objects, they're all connected to each other. Maybe instead of that, try, have a, uh, try to have a centralized object and let it arrange this communication between different objects so that object five will not know about object four. It's more like dog one shouldn't know about the chicken, what's going on about the chicken. Maybe the owner knows dog and chicken himself, but uh, doc doesn't need to know that. And I will continue with some principles. So, uh, as I said, the principles are important to apply the object-oriented design in a proper way. Uh, and it really uh, requires a, a mindset change. Therefore, it may, be, uh, it may be looking hard at first, but actually when you get there, it is very easy. So open close principle says the classes should be open to extension but closed for modification. So what does it say? So we have an area calculator class and it has a list of shapes. Okay? And we have different kind of shapes. So we know now what this triangle means, right? Triangle is a shape. Rectangle is a shape. Square is a shape. And the area calculator has a list of different shapes and 
it is a method called calculate total area, which probably will go over all of the shapes and calculate their area. So in this method, for each shape in their shapes, if shape is a triangle, calculate the area like this. And if shape is a square, calculate the area like this. If shape is a rectangle, like this. So basically, whenever you add a new shape, you have to go and modify this method's behavior, saying that, okay, now I have a circle, or I have a you know rank, or I have whatever. So whenever some added new shape, we have to go and update this. So open close principles basically forbids that. It should be open to extension, but close for modification. So we don't want to modify every time a new shape is added. So how should we solve this? Of course, we can solve it using a common method in this shape, compute area. And each shape will know how to calculate its own area. So that area calculator, instead of this, this was the violating one, it will look like this. For each shape, result plus equals shape dot compute area. Now that each shape can compute its area, whenever I need a new shape to the system, another shape, another shape to the system, this calculate total area method will not change. Okay. It will look exactly the same for whatever shape I added. Single responsibility principle. So every object in the system should have one responsibility, therefore one reason to change. It's more or less related with the cohesion. So we have an automobile class, for example. <clears throat> it starts, stops, it can change tires, it drive, wash, check oil, get oil. So single responsibility says maybe some of these methods are too much for an automobile. For example, can an automobile change tires itself? No. Can an automobile check oil itself? No. Wash itself? No. So when you answer this question, no, can some class do this itself? It basically means probably somebody else should do it. Okay. So changing the tires, for example. Probably a mechanic should do it, checking oil, some kind of uh, technics, technical service, wash, some kind of a car wash service should do it. So basically, we should create different classes out of this. So we have a driver, a driver will drive the automobile. So the new version, this drive will go from here to here. Car wash, so the car will be washed by a car wash. So the parameter will be an automobile, but it will not be here anymore. So these, uh, these bold uh, methods will not be a part of automobile anymore, but they are respected uh, with this uh, new classes. And the automobile is just three. Yeah. So whoever is responsible for doing that, it should do it. Basically, single responsibility principle says that. And interface segregation principle, the idea is a class should never be forced to have some unnecessary methods. So you remember, we say if there are two methods over here, there are the square is a shape and cylinder is a shape. But when you check these two methods will be inherited by square and cylinder. But square doesn't have a volume, right? So we are forcing square to have a volume by creating this kind of structure. What should we do instead? We should maybe create a 2D shape and create a solid shape. Cylinder can both inherit from them, but square is just inheriting from 2D shape because it doesn't have a volume. Okay. So I will finalize. So what can we achieve from this? I will conclude now. There are some sample scenarios that we already adopted and see that it is, it is working. So we can read data from various sources, but our program can stay the same like the data reader example, we can definitely have multiple data format and we will uh, have a single reader uh, definition so that everything can be read by that. Maybe we will easily switch between different algorithms on same data. If we can really uh, say that this is the input to an algorithm and this is the output to an algorithm, we can say that now I will switch it and it will be fine by using an object-oriented design. Make any module work independent from others. So this is our main purpose. We want to reuse it. 
So if they are more independent from others, then we can reuse it, same module in another context, in another project, in another scenario. And make the output of the project independent from the data or the algorithm itself. So regardless of how we read data, either from some uh, author A or author B, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the output will not be uh, bound to the input format that we are reading. Or we may want to do, we may want to create the same input format. That's also fine. I mean, as long as they are all independent, we can do it. And test the correctness of each class independently. So if we know whose responsibility is belongs to what, then we can test the correctness of each class independently in a more uh, uh, meaningful way. And, and this is one of the most important way. We model the problem in a human readable way. Because what we said, the languages are for people, okay, for humans. Therefore, it should be as readable as possible, as understandable as possible, so that we can reuse it easily. And reuse and maintain our, our application better. Maybe it will also be feature proof. And in conclusion, of course, object oriented programming provides a flexible structure for our programs, and it can be applied in many languages. As we said, as long as it supports some of the object oriented structures that has to exist in minimally in a language. And if you obey the principles, it will be an actual system. Otherwise, it was just the same code with extra complexity and extra hardness, okay? with classes and extra complexity. So if you don't obey the principles, we are just adding extra complexity to our projects. Keep this in mind. And of course, it's not a perfect system, but uh, it and it has its own flaws. But it is it is one of the best systems uh, to uh, attack uh, complexity of uh, big projects. And always strive for the best design. Uh, maybe one thing we, to keep this uh, to keep in mind from this presentation: we want to design and we want to code for human, okay? not for the machines. Machines will eventually execute them regardless of the format they are uh, feeded. Thanks, and uh, if you have questions now, I can answer and we can discuss further. Thank you for saying um, for that interesting presentation. I'll just give a moment for people to ask questions. You can, you can use the microphone if you want. Uh, sometimes it's easier to type your questions in the chat window though. So one question is, could you give another practical example of the use of inheritance? So uh, inheritance is what I see mostly common is uh, uh, the data reader example is maybe more appropriate because we want to have a, a few common methods in each class. Okay, for example, for each data reader, there are some common things we all always do reading the file, checking if the file exists or not, or uh, maybe whatever we are doing it, okay? And we want to put them to a base class. So we have a generic data reader. Then for the spatialized methods, maybe what we will do is we will have uh, spatialized readers. So the idea is put the common structures to the base class as much as possible and and the rest, spatial specific versions, will be in individual classes. Uh, I, I hope it's clear. I mean, uh, the question is, uh, would you be able to comment on why using object-oriented techniques is better than simply uh, modularizing your code using functions? Uh, so, of course, uh, they are not like a functional functional programming and object-oriented programming. They are alternative to each other. And uh, it doesn't mean that once but the things we do in object-oriented cannot be done in functional programming. Like, uh, of course, in terms of design, uh, we can design a system using functional programming and using only functions. But as far as I see, uh, the copying the real life is a better uh, example for uh, modeling the problem. Of course, it can be done using functions, but functions are getting crazy and crazy once we have lots of functions. But grouping them together in a meaningful object is uh, sounding more appropriate for me. But it is a matter of preference. 
uh, as far as I see, object oriented has more advantage than functional programming. So uh, another question is, any examples for the dependency inversion and other principle? Uh, dependency inversion and other principle. Well, so let's just go, go back to the design uh, slide, maybe. Uh, yes, uh, uh, in, in this presentation, I didn't put a dependency uh, inversion and the other principle, but uh, dependency inversion basically says uh, we should be able to put an animal when requested uh, a dog. Okay, so we should trust on more generic structures instead of uh, specific structures. So when requested to read data from a project, to parse some data maybe from a file format, we should be able to post the generic file parser instead of a specific one. So uh, I guess uh, what I would do is I would always trust on the generic versions so that the specific versions can already take place of the generic versions. So. Uh, I hope it's a good example, Rafael. So, so you mean that you should try and design to be as abstract as possible and then become specific later on, or? I mean, if you design as, as abstract as possible, the reuse chances are getting higher. Of course, there will be some specific functionalities that you, we will put under uh, the classes under so uh, we will definitely have specific specific methods uh, but if we make uh, like a generic design then we can reuse completely in another project okay does anybody else have any other questions so james l poached my question which was going to be how you choose whether to use object oriented design functional design procedural design and those sort of things um, so I don't have another one other than that. Mm -hmm. Yes, as I said, uh, uh, I favor object-oriented techniques more than functional programming, but uh, uh, I mean, it doesn't mean that functional programming is bad or anything. You know? There you go. So Raphael has another question. Is, is there any piece of software you point out specifically that people can go and look at an open source, source piece of software maybe that has good object oriented design that would serve as a good exemplar? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have any right now, uh, but uh, we are still working on uh, a few frameworks. Uh, will they be open to all? I don't know yet. It, it depends on our collaborators, but we are definitely working on something that that is you know that has a software engineering aspect and some uh, you know uh, industry people aspect also researcher aspect so it is coming but i'm not aware of right now that i can you know suggest to you as that is a, it has a good design probably there exist maybe i don't know yes uh, i will also share the uh, Yes, I will also share this uh, presentation. So for starters, I put some together some resources. So for example, this book is a object-oriented programming with C Sharp, and the book itself is free. And uh, uh, chapter 20 is pure about object-oriented programming. And uh, there are some other resources as well. But I will suggest this book. It is, it is very well written. They have videos and presentations and supported with nice stuff. But the, the thing is, uh, even though there are lots of resources, object orientation requires a change of mindset. So in order to be better at object oriented design, you have to practice and maybe you have to show your design to someone who is, uh, you know, who knows object oriented design. Yeah. So another question by Srikan is how do you differentiate while assigning concepts and principles in a case? What criteria would one use while assigning them? Let's consider a case of two machines, spacecraft, and tractor. So, as I said, uh, in my uh, uh, in my mind, the main idea of object-oriented design is copying the real life. So, 
uh, if you want to design an inheritance system, of course, you wouldn't put spacecraft and tractor to the same uh, subclass, like, okay, they are both uh, cars or they are both uh, things that will take us from A to B. So they can be vehicle at most, right? So when you think you are really thinking the commonality in real world, so what do has spacecraft and tractor has in common? So as far as I see, they are only vehicles. So maybe they don't share anything. They don't have, they don't share any real counts or uh, except name maybe, they don't share anything. So at most, so we can think about this. So I would say if people have other questions or ideas or things they want to comment on, Roger, mm -hmm. please feel free to raise them in the RSC Slack channel. If you're not already a member, you can go and join quite easily. Um, and the conversation can continue there because I know um, that sometimes people have to go. Okay, so there are some more questions. Yes. Then we don't want to keep changing the code, how to approach this problem. So that is one trick of that. Uh, we want to create the uh, relevant classes as much as possible so that we don't keep changing the code, but we are reusing this class. So if we have a reader for Hans et al. file format, we can reuse it in anywhere if we create the class structure very nicely. Okay. So so that we, can, we, we, don't, we don't change the code all the time. That's how we approach the problem. Uh, but object-oriented design is mostly about this too, like to uh, create modules, maybe, you know, mimic real life, and then you will reuse these modules in somewhere else. So yes, uh, you can reach me by email or uh, through the RSE Slack. Uh, I can answer questions and, you know, we can discuss further. Thank you again for listening. No, thank you, Sam, for presenting as well. Um, and thank you everybody else for coming on and joining us for this first of the RSE seminars. Um, the next one is on the 19th of September um, from Chris Richardson from the University of Cambridge, and he's going to talk about interfacing Python with other uh, languages such as Fortran, C, C++. Um, so hopefully that one will be interesting too. And as I said at the start, if anybody else has an idea for a webinar they'd like to give, please just get in touch and we'd like to make this happen. We'd like to help make that happen for you. But thank you, everybody. That was really interesting. Um, and um, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day, wherever you are um, around the world. Thanks again for saying, uh, I'll speak to you soon. Thank you, Andrew.